Greetings, comrades. It is now secret that one of the goals of the sanctions imposed on Russia was to cut it off from modern technologies. And they are expected to hit especially hard in those areas in which Russia is not very successful historically. These areas certainly include microelectronics, computer development and especially microchip manufacturing. Nevertheless, the idea of a full-fledged domestic computer never left the minds of Russia's rulers. And by 2016, mass production of Elbrus central processors and later Baikal processors was launched, which was supposed to be our answer to these damned Intels and AMDs. It's been seven years, and under sanctions a fully localized CPU is what Russia needs most. But are they any good? In general, if you are a little familiar with computers, you should know that 56% of the semiconductor chip market is dominated not just by one country, but by one single company. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. Both your iPhone from Apple, your video card from Nvidia and even computers from Intel contain chips made by TSMC. And yes, you guessed it, the old Russian processor Elbrus and the equally Russian Baikal are also manufactured by the same company. Or rather, they were produced until 2022. Because of the sanctions, this is no longer possible. Moreover, TSMC is holding on to already finished batches of Baikals and Elbruses and is not sending them to customers in Russia. Under such conditions, it would be great to move all production to Russia, especially since all documentation and intellectual property rights are Russian. But the problem is that there is not a single modern microchip production facility in Russia. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. In general, there are a dozen of small microprocessor manufacturers in Russia, but mostly they are all focused on the production of microchips for small specialized niches. Therefore, today we are going to look only at the big CPUs, Baikal and Elbrus. Elbrus has a really unique fully Russian development with its own interesting features. Baikal has potentially the most comprehensible product for the global market, which in theory would be the easiest to commercialize for civilian applications. For a long time, the Russian Elbrus processor has been covered with a certain halo of secrecy. This is not surprising, its roots date back to the Soviet times, when all freshly developed electronic equipment was obviously secret. The result of such secrecy is the accumulation of myths around Elbrus, where antagonists claim that Elbrus is just a relabeled 20-year-old Intel Itanium processor while supporters talk about unique architecture and genius developers, thanks to which Elbrus has unparalleled performance. Let's give a little insight into what these devices really are. And yes, today we'll try to keep complex technical terms to a minimum. If you are interested, you can find a lot of technical literature on them. In fact, the proud name Elbrus was first given to a series of supercomputers developed by Soviet scientist Sevolod Sergeyevich Burtsev in the 1970s. These computers introduced a number of innovations in the theory of computing machines and began to be gradually used in those areas to which the USSR paid increased attention – in the defense industry, in the Space Flight Control Center and in nuclear research facilities. By the way, a famous computer scientist Vladimir Pintkovsky worked on Elbrus supercomputers before moving to the USA and working at Intel. There is a popular legend that the Intel Pentium family was named after him. In addition to supercomputers, by 1988, general-purpose Elbrus 1KB computers were also created, which could possibly become the basic Soviet personal computer in the future. Unfortunately, as you understand, these plans were not destined to come true due to the collapse of the USSR. But in 1992, MCST, the current developer of Elbrus processors, was established on the basis of the Elbrus Free supercomputer development team. For 15 years, they produced processors based on the technologies of the American corporation Sun Microsystems, which promoted the computing machines with the Spark architecture. But by 2007, they decided to return to their roots and to their own developments. They, by and large, did not change their focus. Their unique architecture, Elbrus 2000 E2K, is a further development of Elbrus Free architecture in microprocessor version and their modern processors perform best in the same industries that were the focus of their developers in the USSR, in the military sector. 
And what about Baikal? The history is not that rich, nevertheless, Baikal Electronics is the most transparent Russian processor company for the international market. They don't have their own complicated architecture and instruction sets. They license the widespread MIPS and ARM architectures. The company was the first in Russia to design CPUs with superscalar cores. They work on a more or less modern 28nm and 16nm process. In addition, Baikal Electronics does not have a focus on military hardware. They expect to develop microprocessors for Russian machine tools, printers, networking equipment and, obviously, personal computers. And of course, we start with the disadvantages, and I have already mentioned the biggest one. There is simply no place to assemble these processors in Russia. Both MCST and Baikal Electronics are fabulous companies, that is, they do not have their own production facilities, which, by the way, is perfectly normal for the microelectronics industry. Let me remind you that the latest models of Elbrus and Baikal are assembled with 28 and 16 nanometers process technology respectively. Russia has a Micron factory in Zelenograd, which can in theory start mass production of processes on the 65 nanometer process. Plus, there are rumors about the construction of another factory to create boards with a process technology of about 45 nanometers. So, the lack of a modern plant is the only problem, and with the injection of a lot of money it can be solved? No. In fact, no country in the world right now is able to fully localize the production of microelectronics on a process less than 90 nanometers. Even the US, which has almost everything for this, does not produce photolithography machines. China has spent 1.4 trillion dollars over the last 4-5 years on the development of localized microelectronics production, and needs to spend more. According to the most optimistic estimates, the entire ecosystem for creating a fully localized production of a relative modern CPUs will cost about 500 to 600 billion dollars. This is about a third of Russia's GDP. Naturally, no one would go to such expenses. Especially since the products from a fully localized production facility will have to be sold somewhere. If you want to make cheap microchips, make a lot of them. In the current conditions, the only market is Russia itself, and this market is not big enough for these plans to become profitable. So, even if Russia suddenly finds huge funds to create its own processors, you cannot just build a modern microelectronics factory from scratch. A whole ecosystem is needed. And it's most likely impossible to create such an ecosystem completely isolated from the outside world. Therefore, it would be logical for Russian microprocessor manufacturers to try and choose a niche in which there is no fierce competition, and in which production using the old technological processes is quite acceptable. A 100% Russian Intel and AMD killer based on 100% Russian components is something from the category of science fiction, unfortunately. But let's imagine. Tomorrow the mighty Xi takes over Taiwan and commands to resume production of the latest models of Elbrus and Baikal at its facilities immediately. Now things will go great, right? Not really. And here the problems of Elbrus and Baikal are different. Let's start with the first one. Its disadvantages, oddly enough, arise from its advantages. Namely, from the unique VLIW-based architecture used in it. And if Elbrus Crate is presented as a huge advantage of the CPU, in fact, it is a serious disadvantage. Proprietary architecture means the necessity of porting all software needed by the user. And this is a colossal expense, especially since processors based on VLIW architectures are very demanding to the qualification of programmers compiling programs for this platform. That is, you need not just a lot of programmers, but a lot of highly qualified programmers who will be adapting or rewriting software especially for Elbrus day and night. Elbrus has hardware-level support for binary translation from x86, which means potentially being able to run programs familiar to users without any rewriting. But, you see, this all consumes CPU resources. Plus, VLAW architecture is fundamentally inferior in performance to modern RISC CISC processors. As a result, we get a disappointing conclusion. The uniqueness of Elbrus is a big plus in some areas, more on this later, but a giant minus in many others. 
And it is not about the specific implementation or professionalism of Elbrus developers. No matter how genius they are and no matter what modern factories are available to them, the very architecture of Elbrus will not allow it to serve as a base platform for mass production of domestic computing equipment. Only in some rather specific niches. And I have not yet mentioned the prices for Elbrus, which are simply exorbitant and only the state-run businesses have a realistic opportunity to purchase them. And even then, until 2022, Russian businesses were not shy in evaluating the prospects of Elbrus. For example, in 2021, two types of service on Elbrus processors were provided to Sberbank for testing. After four months of tests, Sberbank called the results catastrophic. The service showed compliance in only 7 out of 44 parameters. And, according to a company spokesman, there is not the slightest chance that the service provided for testing will be used in the bank in their current form. Everything is simpler with Baikal. They have no problems with optimization, with software, with finding a suitable niche. They are much more promising in the civilian sector and could become truly mass market due to the globally known ARM architecture. The only problem they have is that they have nothing of their own except microprocessor design. The design is not bad, but not brilliant. The processors themselves are not terrible, but without any zest. A standard ARM chip, there are dozens of them. In theory, they could be used in government agencies, hospitals, schools, in not too demanding workstations. And in 2021, many Russian companies were really looking at Baikal's to transfer all their office stuff to them. But Baikal processors are a. still too expensive, b. have been out of production for a year and a half, and c. are based on the British licensed architecture, which can be withdrawn at any time. After all this, of course, it is hard to talk about the pluses of Russian processors, but they are there nonetheless. So let's end on a positive note. The main plus is that these processors exist at all. Because after the collapse of the USSR for the first 15 years, Russia actually had no own developments in this field. And the same MCST did not collapse only due to cooperation with the Americans. Therefore, even modest success of Baikal and Elbrus in the last 10 years are still successes. The very fact that they were beginning to be compared with CPUs from Intel and AMD is a huge win. Yes, they can hardly compete with popular Western solutions, but with decent government support they could well occupy their niche in state-owned enterprises. Moreover, if Baikal and Elbrus can boast of something, it is safety. If the goal is to create an infrastructure independent of foreign technologies and IT vendors, which will not have hardware trojans and inherent vulnerabilities, then Elbrus will certainly come in handy. Due to its architectural peculiarities, Elbrus does not have such vulnerabilities as, for example, the famous Meltdown and Spectre of Intel and AMD. This means that such solutions can be used relatively safely in various sensitive strategic areas for working state companies, and so on. In the public sector, domestic processors can be successfully used everywhere – in schools, universities, libraries. Baikal will be better suited for this purpose, as there is no need to rewrite software for it. Everything will be more or less familiar to the user, except that you'll have to get used to Linux. If we talk about the more unique Elbrus, it is potentially more powerful. If we can collect specialists all over Russia who will be ready to rewrite all software for its structure, Elbrus processors can show excellent performance. Moreover, recently skillful people have managed to befriend Elbrus with modern games and run GTA 5, Cyberpunk and Atomic Heart on PCs based on these CPUs. And Gaijin Entertainment went further than anyone else and officially ported its War Thunder game to the Elbrus architecture. The results are impressive, more than 100 FPS. However, it is still worth recalling that a fully domestic PC that will be able to run these games will cost about $6,000. A foreign analog of comparable performance and without the hassle of porting programs or emulating x86 can be purchased for like $7,800. Therefore, of course, we should not expect a special spread of personal PCs on Elbrus even inside Russia. But we haven't forgotten what I said at the very beginning, have we? 
The Russian Elbrus, just like its Soviet predecessor, was never meant to become a mass civilian product. It has always been primarily oriented towards military applications. The uses of these processes are primarily Russian law enforcement and security agencies. These CPUs have reduced power consumption, protected mode of program execution and transparency of architecture. In the military sector, the very possibility to avoid foreign components is already a big and main competitive advantage of Elbrus. And performance can be sacrificed for safety, even the modern process technology is not critical here. If we consider only this sphere, then perhaps the task of creating a critical information infrastructure of the state on the basis of Russian components can indeed be solved. Russian factories could produce medium performance microchips for tasks that are not as demanding in terms of speed as in terms of security, while high performance solutions could be produced in China. But even in this extremely optimistic case, it is impossible to say that we should wait a little longer and Russian processors will become worthy competitors to the solutions from Intel and AMD. No, of course not. And realistically, there was never such a goal. Thanks for watching, guys. And as always, a huge shout out to Stake221, Steven, Yeliseta Zaharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zimon Berze, Jordan Lamont, Jimmy Albin, Ellie, and Petr Ilich. See you next time.